Welcome. We're looking at the latest ATLS guideline updates today. That's right. And these changes, they really matter for how you manage trauma patients day to day. Absolutely. We want to highlight the, uh, the most important shifts for your practice. Things like algorithm changes, how we resuscitate, even some key terminology updates. Okay, let's get straight into it. What's the biggest headline change? I'd say it's the X, A, B, C, D, E algorithm. That X at the start. The X, what does they stand for? Exsanguinating hemorrhage. Massive bleeding. The update prioritizes controlling that first. Before airway, breathing. Yes. Before anything else, if it's life-threatening external bleeding, the rationale is simple. Rapid blood loss is, you know, the top preventable cause of death and trauma. So find it. Stop it immediately. Find it, stop it. That's the first step now. X, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, X, A, B, C, D, E. Makes sense. What about resuscitation then? The emphasis now is on a uh, balanced resuscitation. You mean? Meaning early and smart use of blood products. Not yeah. just flooding patients with crystalloids anymore when they're in hemorrhagic shock. So blood products alongside crystalloids. Or instead of... Well, often in addition to crystalloids initially, but getting blood products in much earlier, especially for severe bleeding. This helps tackle the coagulopathy, the clotting problems that come with major hemorrhage. Right. You need the clotting factors too, not just volume. Exactly. And uh, tranexamic acid, TXA. Still important. Very important. And the guideline reinforces giving it early for significant hemorrhage. How early? Specifically within the first three hours of the injury happening. Okay. The evidence really supports this early TXA. TXA administration improves survival, that three-hour window is key. Three hours for TXA. Noted. Yeah. Any other major bleeding focus areas? Yes, definitely. There is an increased focus on the pelvis. That's a source of bleeding. A major source. It can hold a huge amount of blood. So expect to see um, updated techniques or reminders about recognizing pelvic fractures early. And stabilizing them quickly. Precisely. Early stabilization of pelvic fractures is highlighted as a way to control that potentially massive internal hemorrhage. Good point. That's a big hidden space for blood loss. What about spinal care? Heard there was a terminology change. There was. We're moving away from spinal immobilization. Okay. To what? The term now is restriction of spinal motion. Restriction of motion. Sounds subtle. What's the practical difference? It reflects a more uh, selective approach. It's not about automatically strapping everyone to a board anymore. Ah, so based more on clinical assessment. Exactly. Assess the patient, look for specific indications, restrict motion if needed, but not routinely for everyone. It acknowledges potential downsides to prolonged immobilization. That seems more patient-centered. What about the team aspect? Big emphasis there, too. Expanded sections on team resource management or TRM. Communication roles, yeah. that sort of thing. Yes. Good TRM is presented as, well, vital for optimal patient care. Clear, effective communication is stressed. Mm -hmm. And the MESTI framework for patient handovers is reinforced. Nest, remind us. Mechanism, injuries found or suspected, signs and symptoms, vital signs, trends, and treatment given. Right. A standardized way to transfer information. Ensures nothing critical gets missed during handover. Okay. Any changes to specific procedures, like needle decompression? Yes, for needle thoracocentesis, there are updated recommendations for the um, optimal placement site. Where to put the needle. Yeah. It reflects newer anatomical understanding to improve the chances of actually hitting the pleural space effectively, a more refined target location. Good to know the landmark might have shifted slightly. Mm. What about specific patient groups, kids? older adults. That's another key update. Considerations for geriatric and pediatric trauma are now integrated throughout the main content. Not just separate chapters. Right. Woven into the core material, it highlights their unique physiology, you know, how they differ from the average adult. And emphasizes specific management strategies needed for them. Exactly. Because what works for a 30-year-old might not be right for an 80-year-old or an 8-year-old. Makes sense to integrate that thinking mm -hmm. throughout. Mm -hmm. I also saw mentions of DEI and FLXX reviews. Yes. All the materials were reviewed through a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. To ensure. To ensure the content is relevant and applicable across diverse patient populations and providers. And the FLEX review looks at applicability across different resource settings. FLEX. Flexible. Sort of, yeah. yeah. Making sure the core principles can be applied whether you're in a major trauma center or a more resource-limited environment. So, guidelines that aim to work for everyone everywhere. That's the goal. It's all about evidence-based, patient-centered care in this 11th edition. Ultimately aimed at improving outcomes for critically injured patients. That's the bottom line. Better outcomes.
So as people listening process these changes, the real task is integration, isn't it? Absolutely. Thinking about how these updates like XABCDE or early blood products actually change what you and your team do at the bedside. It probably raises questions for existing protocols. It should. It's a good time to review local guidelines and maybe ask, are we fully aligned with this latest evidence? Today, we're looking at something that is a, a genuine revolution happening right now in critical care, a real trauma resuscitation paradigm shift. It really is. For decades, the mantra has been airway, breathing, circulation, you know, mm -hmm. the classic ABC sequence. But the evidence is now so compelling that for a specific high risk patient, that order is being flipped. And that's the core of this discussion. We're talking about patients with massive, immediate, life-threatening blood loss, what we call exsanguinating injuries. Right. For this group, the sequence is now circulation, airway, breathing, or CAB. Hmm. And this shift isn't just a theory. It's driven by outcomes, by the need to focus every single second on hemorrhage control. I think we need to establish just how big a change this is. The ABCs were fundamental, right? Ingrained in everyone. So what changed? Why challenge something that's been doctrined for decades? Well, we finally had to acknowledge that the ABC protocol it was originally designed for cardiac arrest. That's a primary oxygenation failure. Well, Hemorrhagic shock where the patient is bleeding out. That's a primary perfusion failure. If well, you don't have blood volume, you just you don't have a pump. Yeah. And the numbers, I mean, the cold, hard numbers show hemorrhage is the leading cause of preventable trauma death, almost 40% worldwide. Our job is to get rid of that 40%. So the crisis we're solving is that preventable death from blood loss. Let's look at the mechanism. Why is sticking to that old approach, securing the airway first, why is that so dangerous for a patient who's lost a massive amount of blood? It creates what we sometimes call a double hit. Hmm. First, you have to think about what the body is doing on its own. It's compensating. Mm hmm when you lose blood, your body dumps massive amounts of catecholamines adrenaline, mm -hmm. and that causes this powerful systemic vasoconstriction. It's a defense mechanism, squeezing the vessels to keep what little blood is left in the core to perfuse the heart and brain. It's the body's last-ditch effort to survive, and we come along and stop that. Exactly. The induction medications we use for intubation, even in tiny doses, they immediately disrupt that vasoconstriction. The vessels relax, the core pressure just plummets, and the little volume they had is suddenly not enough. That's strike one. And strike two is the ventilator itself, the positive pressure. Yes. When you start positive pressure ventilation, you're forcing air into the chest, which increases the pressure in there. Right. And that physical pressure squeezes the big vessels, specifically the vena cava, that are returning blood to the heart. It just crushes the preload. It's like it's like trying to run a pump when the hose is crimped and the tank is almost empty. The heart can just collapse. You risk immediate cardiac arrest. Okay, so you have a trauma patient, massive blood loss, their mental status is depressed. Let's say a Glasgow Coma Scale score of six. Traditionally, that's an indication for intubation. How do we rethink that? You have to remember the cause. A depressed GCS in this scenario is very often because of inadequate cerebral perfusion. The brain is starving because there isn't enough volume circulating. It's not necessarily a primary head injury. That's a huge clinical dilemma, though. If we delay intubation and focus on circulation, what about the risk of aspiration or the airway collapsing? And that is the exact friction point you know, that the CIB approach addresses. Yeah. We're making a calculated risk assessment. The certainty is that intubating a profoundly hypovolemic patient almost guarantees cardiovascular collapse. Wow. If we prioritize circulation, get blood back into the system, we often see that GCS score just shoot up. The patient starts to wake up because their brain is getting perfused again. And we may have completely avoided the hemodynamic disaster of intubation. <laughs> We're trading a theoretical risk for an immediate, very high probability of circulatory arrest. Let's move into that C's phase then, circulation. If we've put volume above everything else, what are we putting into the patient? What's the absolute priority? The priority is hemostatic resuscitation meaning we're using products that actually stop the bleeding and restore clotting. Whole blood, whenever it's available, should be the first-line fluid. Why whole blood specifically? Because it's physiologically what the patient lost. It has red cells for oxygen, plasma for clotting factors, and platelets. All in one bag. And in places where whole blood isn't on the shelf, which is pretty common, what's the balance ratio we should be using? The strong recommendation is a balanced transfusion. You're giving red blood cells, plasma, and platelets in a specific one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one ratio. One-to-one-to-one? -to -one -to -one? Yes, and that's so important. You're not just replacing oxygen carriers with red cells. You have to replace the coagulation factors that were lost. 
maintaining that balance is how you fight that vicious cycle of trauma. On that note, what kind of fluid do we need to actively avoid in that initial phase? We have to be really strict about avoiding the excessive use of crystalloids, things like normal saline or lactated ringers. But they add volume, right? They do, but it's empty volume. They have no oxygen carriers, no clotting factors. All they do is contribute to hemodilution, basically thinning out the patient's remaining blood, washing out the few clotting factors they have left, which just makes the bleeding worse. That sounds like a fast track to the lethal triad. It is. The lethal triad hypothermia, coagulopathy, and acidosis. Crystalloids make coagulopathy and acidosis worse. Everything we do in the CAB approach is designed to reverse that triad, not contribute to it. Okay, what if intubation just can't be avoided? Maybe there's severe facial trauma or the airway is about to close. If we have to do it in that critically hypovolemic state, what medications are we choosing? Anesthetic choice here is literally life or death. Yeah. We have to pick drugs with the lowest cardiovascular impact. Ketamine or etomidate are preferred because they tend to maintain that sympathetic tone. And what do we avoid? You absolutely have to avoid agents like propofol. It is a potent vasodilator. It will drop their blood pressure off a cliff, guaranteeing catastrophic hypotension. And you use the lowest possible dose of paralytics. Ideally, you start the blood products before you even push the induction drugs. Give them a buffer. And this whole philosophy, it's not just an ER decision, is it? It's a whole continuum of care. How does CAB start with the very first responder in the field? It starts with immediate, aggressive hemorrhage control. Circulation in the field means physical control first. Okay. That's rapid application of extremity tourniquets for any limb injury. It's using junctional hemorrhage devices for those tricky spots where limbs meet the torso, the groin, the armpit. And it's deep, effective wound packing. You have to stop the leak first. And for those longer transports or for severe bleeding inside the torso that you can't just press on, what's the advanced technique for that? That's where you get into Reboa resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. It's essentially an internal tourniquet. That's a perfect way to put it. A catheter goes in, usually through the femoral artery, and a balloon is inflated in the aorta to block blood flow to the lower bleeding part of the body. It centralizes all the remaining volume to the heart and the brain, and it buys you a critical window of time to get to a surgeon. So when the patient finally gets to the operating room with this massive bleeding, the surgical mindset has to be different too, right? completely different. It's all about damage control surgery. Time is the enemy. The surgeon's only goal is swift, immediate control of the bleeding. Ligating, packing, shunting, whatever is fastest. So no long, complex repairs? Absolutely not. The definitive, meticulous reconstruction is deferred. The patient is too cold, too acidotic, and too coagulopathic for that. The surgeon gets in, stops the bleeding with temporary measures, and gets the patient out to the ICU for resuscitation. Once they're stable, once that triad is reversed, then they go back for the final operation. What about interventional radiology? How does that fit into this paradigm? That's a great point. IR procedures, like embolizing a bleeding vessel, are often perfect for the circulation-first philosophy. When it's feasible, you can do these interventions with deep sedation and analgesia and completely avoid intubation and positive pressure. You're fixing the leak without disrupting the body's own compensatory mechanisms. Now, this shift is especially striking when we talk about kids. Their physiology is just so different. Why are children so vulnerable to the risks of early intubation? Children are um, they're masters of compensation. They have much more robust vasoconstriction than adults, so they can maintain a normal blood pressure for a very long time, even while they're bleeding out. So hypotension is a very, very late sign. It is the final sign. It's not a warning. It's imminent collapse. They're often in profound shock by the time their blood pressure finally drops. And because their compensation is so good, when it fails, it fails catastrophically. That double hit of induction drugs and positive pressure can push them right over the edge. What does the data tell us about transfusion for kids who need massive transfusions? The data is pretty clear. Achieving a plasma to red blood cell ratio of at least 1 to 2 is associated with a 51% reduction in 24-hour mortality. A 51% reduction, that's huge. It's massive. It just underscores how important it is to replace those clotting factors along with the red cells. And we talked about avoiding crystalloids in adults. Is there a specific limit for kids? Yes, and the standard is very precise. You limit crystalloid resuscitation to a single 20 milliliter per kilogram bolus. That's it. If that one bolus doesn't work, you must transition immediately to blood products. Any more crystalloid just makes them colder and more diluted, and they tolerate that extremely poorly. 
Okay, so let's circle back to the A and B now that we've prioritized C. If we're delaying the advanced airway step, how do we make sure the patient is actually, you know, getting oxygen? We use simpler, less invasive tools. You maintain oxygenation with passive oxygen, like a non-rebreather mask or maybe a superglottic airway. These don't require paralyzing the patient. You're keeping oxygen flowing while the volume is being restored, and you do not use paralytics until that volume is optimized. And once you do intubate and you have to start positive pressure ventilation, the breathing part, is there a specific strategy to minimize that negative impact on circulation? Yes, you have to use a lung protective strategy, yeah. specifically low tidal volumes, yeah. smaller breaths. Low tidal volumes mean lower peak airway pressures, and that reduces the physical squeeze on the vena cava. The less pressure in the chest, the more easily blood can get back to the heart. It all comes back to prioritizing perfusion, even after the tube is in. This philosophy, it touches every specialty, from the medic in the field to the surgeon in the OR. So what's the final takeaway on making this work system-wide? I think the key word is synchronization. CAB is a multidisciplinary resuscitation bundle. It requires effective, standardized communication across EMS, the emergency department, trauma surgery, anesthesia, Every single team member has to understand that every decision from which drug you pick to your vent settings, it all has to be relentlessly focused on minimizing blood loss and preserving perfusion. The central shift is clear then. Hemorrhage control and early balanced blood product resuscitation. That one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one ratio that has to come before advanced airway management in the patient who is actively bleeding out. That's a profound change. It is. And, you know, the most valuable knowledge is the knowledge you actually apply. This CAD paradigm directly challenges the rigid protocol so many of us learned. It forces you to ask the question, how often has the decision to intubate in your trauma bay been dictated by a score rather than a dynamic real-time assessment of whether the real problem is a lack of oxygen or lack of volume? Hmm. Understanding that difference, that's how we maximize survival. Thinking about that physiological difference is what gives you the power to truly optimize resuscitation. We hope you can put this knowledge to use. Until next time.